Blockers Online Academy. And, and man, we, obviously, it's it's great to hear about just the the strides that you're making and some of the things you're doing to try to share ideas within the community and and uh, some of that stuff. So I think that stuff's really neat, and and uh, I'm all about that. And have tried to, you know, everybody stole something from somebody else. And so I've been really fortunate that I've had some great guys to steal from. And um, so all of those things are present here, you know, in terms of some of the things that we do now and kind of where we started and, and things that I, you know, guys that I played for and things that I learned from them and, and how those manifest themselves and what we do now at SVSU. So, um, just a little bit about just background in terms of where all this stuff came from and, and some different folks that I've been able to, to glean some things from over the course of time is, um, you know, started at uh, University of Idaho and, and got to play for um, Tim Drevno and Tom Cable there. They're kind of two, um, Coach Cable, I believe, is, is with the Las Vegas Raiders still as the offensive line coach. I know up until recently, Coach Drevno was with, was the old line coach at USC and stuff. I, I haven't had a ton of dialogue with those guys here really anytime recently. Um, but definitely learned a ton when I was with those guys there, 2001, 2002, and then went to Grand Valley and played for Coach Quinn uh, and Coach Kelly and then Coach Martin, uh, Coach Brocklebank, who, who was an administrator now uh, from 2003 to 2006. And so learned a ton from Coach Quinn. Coach Quinn's a huge reason why I'm in coaching. Um, and uh, so a lot of those things, we were a big gap scheme team, ran, ran a lot of power and tackle pull and, and those things. Those were kind of our big plays when Coach Kelly was still there, and then we really still run a lot of tackle pull and uh, we're running, you know, outside zone was kind of our, our top play there towards the end of the time when I was there. So we didn't run any inside zone. So most of this presentation and, and some of the things I'm going to talk about and a huge part of what we do here is, is inside zone and, and drilling inside zone and different ways that we run it and why we've been successful at doing it and things like that. Um, but we didn't really run the inside zone when I was in school, so I had to learn a lot um, about inside zone right as I was getting into the profession. So my first year at UW Stevens Point was my free, you know, it was my GA it was those two years, and I was promoted there, um, and then got a chance to come over to Alma, be an offensive coordinator and an offensive line coach. Uh, but when I was at Stevens Point, I went down uh, to Illinois State and to visit George Barnett, and really most of the things I learned about inside zone. Uh, learned from Coach Barnett, didn't get it to GA for him. He was at Grand Valley after I was there. So that's how I was able to, um, you know, just kind of get in contact with me, coach my brother. My brother played there after I was done. And so uh, a lot of this stuff is, is could potentially sound like a regurgitation of a lot of things that I learned from Coach Barnett. And obviously he's been wildly successful and has been Coach Martin's offensive line coach and just recently went to uh, to Tulane. Um, he's been a big influence, even though I didn't necessarily GA for him. Um, but a, a bunch of, you know, four or five hour film sessions, like coach helped me with some of these things. And he was, he was awesome. Um, when, uh, when I was just a GA and was, didn't really know him that well. And so something I'm very appreciative for, but, uh, so that's what I learned, you know, about inside zone. And so what we, you know, you know I think we'll get into it here in a second, but about 43% of the time in 2019, we were calling some type of inside zone. we got a bunch of different variations and ways that we do it. We, we're a big, you know, formation motion teams, things like that. We try to be very simple, but but look very complicated. Um, but that's that's kind of the base of, of what we're going to talk about today. But again, we're um, I got to SVSU in 2018, so I had a couple stops in between. Um, but just kind of, you know, Coach Brady got here in 2019 um, from Ferris State. Our head coach had left, and so uh, we had had made some pretty good headway. All right. So I got here in 2018. I was with the previous staff for a year, previous staff head coach left and I got retained by the staff that came in and we had been really a, like inside zone was probably our best where we were okay in the gap scheme game. We weren't necessarily great at, at really anything laterally. Um, weren't, weren't a great wide zone team uh, yet at that point in time. Um, and so when the, the new staff came over, uh, Ferris had ran a lot of power read. They had ran a lot of gap schemes and things like that. They were a big kind of inside pin pull team. Um, and so I think it was good for our guys because I was able to kind of say, hey, listen, we're, you know, we're going to continue to read defenders and be an option team and do all these things. But I think what we're going to be best at here for a period of time is 
is kind of majoring in inside zone. And so that, that went over really well, obviously, anytime you, you get with a new staff, there's always a, a feeling out and people have to share ideas and decide, you know, what, what's the best thing for us going forward and things like that. So we were essentially able to take everything that we had done that first year and then kind of carry it over pretty well and not necessarily change too much uh, schematically going into 2019 and obviously 2020. We didn't, we were undefeated. So that's good. It's positive that we didn't play. All right. So that's, that's my favorite joke to use. And nobody likes very much, but um, so we were pretty excited about where we're headed and what we thought we we're going to be able to do. And unfortunately we didn't get to play. So um, we're a division two school in, uh, in Michigan and mid Michigan is kind of what it's called. We're about an hour, maybe 15 minutes just north and maybe slightly west of Detroit. Um, so our footprint is the Midwest. So that's what we're looking for. outstanding offensive linemen. Um, and, and I think at the end of the day, if we get where we want to go and we accomplish our goals and do some of the things that we want to do, you're going to have to win big games in, you know, November, December in the Midwest, you know, locally, and it's going to be cold and there's going to be snow on the ground and those things. So ultimately we, you know, we really like staying around here um, in terms of where we recruit guys. We've got guys from Illinois, uh, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin, and, and a lot of our guys obviously hail from Michigan. So, um, but we're never, never again. So obviously guys that watch this, guys that have guys are like, man, this guy's really, really good. And he's just under the radar. And I don't know why nobody's recruiting him. Well, he's only 6'1". And the Division One school say he needs to be 6'4". Or, whatever those things are. Um, I love recruiting undersized offensive linemen. Love recruiting offensive linemen that, uh, you know, bigger schools don't think their arms are long enough or, you know, schools don't, don't think they necessarily have the measurables and things like that. I think division two football is a great thing because it doesn't really exclude anybody. You know, there's, I mean, it definitely excludes guys, but I think far less than you would see at some bigger levels. So I think uh, some of the best players that we've had here, some of the best players, we won three national championships in the four years I was at GVSU. And there was a lot of guys there that if you looked at them on a roster, you probably wouldn't think much of them. So I think that's a big deal for us in terms of um, if you have guys that you think are good players that aren't getting looked at, email me, send them to me. Uh, I love looking at guys like that. So all my contact information is on the bottom. If you like any of the things that you hear, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, would love to share ideas. always love doing things like this. Obviously, it's awesome that coaches doing that. So, um, so. In, in 2011, 12, and 13, Saginaw Valley State won three consecutive GLIAC North championships um, and had a really good quarterback that's still playing in Canada, really good receiver that played a bunch of years in the NFL, a couple of really good offensive linemen, really great offense, um, and ran the ball really well, threw the ball extremely well. And since then, it's been kind of a struggle to get back to that level of success. So I got here in 2018. And if you kind of look at, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, and just kind of going back even a little bit further, um, you know, Jerry Kill was here in the, in the 90s, all right, had tremendous success, obviously went on to, um, you know, be a tremendous Division One head coach, Southern Illinois, Northern Illinois, and University of Minnesota. And when he was here, they ran triple option. And when he left, I want to say it was in 1998, somewhere around there, uh, they kind of became a run and shoot team, a four wide team. Um, and I've, I've been you know, for whatever reason, a lot of the places I've been when I was when I was in Alma, they had been kind of that same thing. And a lot of guys would tell me that we're in that, you know, in that world for a long time would just say, hey, listen, you know, there's nothing wrong with throwing the ball. There's nothing wrong with putting receivers on the field. There's nothing wrong with all those things. Um, but, you know, you have to make sure your program maintains an edge. And if you throw the ball too much, you know, that can happen if you're not real careful. So um, I had kind of been a couple of different places where they had been run and shoot teams, they had been heavy throw teams and 10 P teams and things like that. And so I think in all those instances at Alma and here, I thought because of the nature of the school, because of our location, because of our proximity to outstanding offensive linemen and just some of these other things, I really felt like, man, this is a place where you could build a tremendous offensive line and lead offensive line and be really physical and run the football and do some of those things that we love to do as offensive line coaches. Um, so, what, what we really try to do. So we had some success um, in, you know, 2018, we had lost um, going back, obviously had, had struggled there 14, 15, 16, and then and 17. And then um, 18, we had lost two really good backs uh, that we had prior to the season. Um, so we had, you know, obviously we're just a little bit shorthanded 
that season, my first season, but had had some more success in some different areas by some different metrics. And then we got a couple of those guys back in 2019, had one of the better years that we've had going back, you know, to Jerry Kill. So had a thousand yard back that is, you know, was going to be his fourth year this year. So he's going to leave and go to the NFL. We're really excited for him. Tremendous kid, an athlete. Um, and we had two running backs over six yards of carry. So I was like looking at metrics like that, like anybody can have a thousand yard back if you've got, you know, a tremendous you know, athlete that can make people miss and do some of those things. But we, we really chart run efficiency. That's to me, the biggest metric of, whether or not we're doing our offensive, our, our, our work as offensive line coaches effectively. Um, so we, you know, we were able to have some more success on kind of going to some of the run efficiency and how we, how we decide that, that we're getting better or not getting better and some of those types of things um, here in a minute. Um, but my favorite story is the story of the Zen Master and Rule Boy, right? The boy's born, everybody in the town says, great, that's amazing. All right, and the Zen Master said, we'll see. All right, and the boy grows up and they give him a horse and everybody in the, in the village says, that's great. And the Zen master says, we'll see. Then he falls off the horse and breaks his leg. All right, and the Zen master says, you know, everybody says that's terrible. And the Zen master says, well, we'll see. But then a war comes and he can't go to war because his leg's broken. You know, everybody says, that's great. Zen master says, we'll see. So you look at those numbers and you're like, okay, well, you're getting better. Things are improving, things like that. Well, you know, the Zen master said, we'll see. So um in terms of and again the crux of this is going to be about inside zone how we teach and coach inside zone we try to be we run inside zone um and we run a wide zone and we run gap schemes so that's who we are that's what we do and again it's obviously not as simple as saying we're going to run three schemes um but there's obviously variations within that are we run our inside zone four different ways all right so we cut off the backside defensive end we you know we, we base those backside two defenders or, or one defender if it's a three down look and we insert you know for the that will or the minus one or whatever you want to call that guy uh and we run gun read um and we we wham that backside guy as well so there's a couple different ways that we'll run our inside zone and all different variations 10 you know 10p 11p 12p all those things um but for us i, I want to know a bunch of things when we evaluate a play and we go in after the season and we dive in and we say listen you know, how often did we gain four yards? Did we get half of it back on second down? Uh, did we get the first down on third and any type of short or fourth and any type of short? Um, then that counts as an efficient run. So when you look at some of those different things, I think when you when you characterize our run game, inside zone probably maybe wasn't as big a percentage in terms of chunk runs. Um, and I always like to take out the outliers. One of those inside zone inserts, we had a 90 that was in there. So you know, if you, if you take that out, well, well, okay, what was your yards per carry then? Okay, and how efficient were you then if you take out some of those big outliers? Because sometimes yards per carry can lie to you uh, at different times. So um, these are, but again, like 43% of the time we're, we're lining up and we're running the football. Um, you know, it's at some type of inside zone. So I always go back to, I, I became fascinated with Minnesota in 2019. Um, and when you watch what those guys do, and I was, very, I mean, it's obviously extremely impressive. They had a tremendous year, had a really good offensive line, ran the ball extremely well. It's like, man, I feel like they're running wide zone and cutting off the backside defensive end. And I think they're running inside zone and cutting that guy off. And I know it's not that simple. I know there's more things that are in there. Um, but at the same time, it's like, man, these guys are running two plays, I, like 95% of the time, you know. And the great thing about the pandemic was we can go through on YouTube, we can watch it all. We can watch everything we want to watch. We can watch everything we ever want to watch and then go back and watch it twice. We had enough time to do it because we were all stuck at home. And so I was able to really dive into like, if we want to run a play and be effective, how often do we have to run it? Okay. All right. And it goes back to somebody said this to me once when I was really young and I was fortunate enough to be paying attention at the time. Um, we want to be as simple as we can possibly be and still solve all our problems. So again, if we, if we want to run the ball in the middle of the field, well, can you technically do that just by running inside zone? Do you need to go run gap schemes? Do you need to do all these other things? Um, I, I don't know. It depends. Depends on your circumstances. Depends on your players. Depends how smart they are. Depends on how many reps you have. Depends on, you know, this, that, and the other. But I think at the end of the day, I've always used that as, a, as kind of a guiding a principle as we want to make sure we can solve all our problems. If you say, well, I want to be really simple and I only want, I only want to run one play, and then eventually you're going to do a situation that unless you get more complicated, you're not going to have the answer to it. So 
I've always said, like, we want to you know, look at our schedule and look at the defenses we see and watch everybody that we can and say, I want to be absolutely as, as, you know, as simple as I can, but I still want to be able to solve all my problems. So at any rate, uh, all these were good for us. Um, I think when you look at like the chunk plays, we categorize as a 12 yard rush or 20 yard throw. Um, I want to say there was like six tens and two 11s or something like that. And with the inside zone cutoff, obviously we ran it so much. So there was, you know, a, a, a bunch more that were about to be chunked. So we're, we're chunking the other team 11% of the time, 11, uh, 11% of the time. And then, you know, we're calling negative plays 6% of the time. And I think what we found with inside zone was a lot of those negatives are minus ones. Now minus ones are different than minus tens as we know. So, it's not necessarily everything being encompassed when you look at this eval, but at the same time, I think obviously when you're saying, okay, you're calling this thing almost all the time, you're getting six yards, you know, a carry. And did we call it too much or should we, what are we doing? We should have been calling it more. You're getting six yards every time you do it, why aren't you doing it more? You know, that kind of thing. So we try to play devil's advocate, and ask ourselves all those kinds of questions and make sure that if, if we, I think what I'm, what I'm coming to over time is, you know, there's less is more. And, you know, the more you do of something, the better you tend to get at it. So, uh, but at the same time, you still got to be able to solve all your problems. So you can kind of go to the next thing. And what we really try to hammer is, you know, how we get to this. So I think when you look at all those numbers and some of those things we just showed you on the last slide, it's like, if we're doing this 43% of the time when we run the ball now, we run a lot of RPO, right? So there's a lot of instances that don't get charted because we throw a glance to the boundary. We throw some type of quick game to the field or some of those types of things that we do. Um, but at the end of the day, we charted 366 runs, which is about, it's 30 some per game where we call a run play, we hand the ball off to the back and we don't get you know a penalty or something like that. Those are actual charted runs. So um, we know that this needs to be X percentage of our drill work. Okay, so obviously a lot of the things that we do are built towards uh, being good at inside zone, towards our guys understanding their aiming points and how to work to their aiming points, and some of the different variables that they're gonna see, um, you know, whether it be defenders uh, giving you a variable late in a play or a defense giving you variables by running a, a stun or a blitz or some of those different types of things obviously that we know we have to deal with. So. Um, this is our beginning. Okay. So we try to break everything down and we start what we're doing with air starts. Okay. And so I think there's a certain amount of, we, we do a really good job warming our guys up and things like that. And the first thing we do, uh, once we get done with that is we do, you know, what, what coach calls team tempo and team tempo is essentially, um, us running through our perimeter plays and essentially kind of getting the guys going physically um and by the time we get you know it's 40 30 20 10 so we run a play from the 40 we run up we run a play from the 30 we run up on the other hash play from the 20 other hash play from the 10 so we want to get our guys moving so that by the time we get to indy guys are ready to go okay and then once we get into our teaching progression which is is totally guided by some of these things we're talking about in terms of what are we going to do most of the time you know, how much of our time are we going to spend throwing the ball? Okay, well, then we need to spend X amount of time in pass pro drills and things like that. How much of our time are we going to spend um, running the football? How much time are we going to spend running the inside zone? How much of the time are we going to spend running our gap schemes and things like that? And just making sure that those things are reciprocal time-wise, percentage-wise to uh, whatever percentage of time we think we're probably going to use those individual schemes. It's never perfect. You certainly don't have a crystal ball, you can't necessarily tell exactly, um, but we try to do as good a job with that as we can. And so I think if we do a drill, because we don't have that much time, right, for drills, um, we need to be really confident that this is going to mimic something that we're going to do, preferably with as much resistance, um, you, know, si you know, similar to what they would deal with in a game. And we really talk to guys about maximizing their, their practice reps and the guys that ultimately do that are, are guys that get better and play and guys that don't, you know, go, go the opposite direction. So essentially what we start with is our zone path, okay, and fundamentals. And so while we're doing this, all right, 
I'm wearing my red ninja outfit, first of all. All right, which is awesome. Okay. All right. Nobody thinks that, I think, but me. But um, we're barking things at them. Just this is like fundamental time. So we want them to go five yards. I want it to be a full speed deal. I want to talk to them about their hands. I want to talk to them about their feet. I want to talk to them about their aiming points on the guy that's not there and some of those things to try to make sure and get our minds going for uh, what these things are. Now, again, these guys do it every single day. So some of these guys have been doing this for two, three, four years. Um, so I think it's really important that we, we find things that these guys need to get better at so these things don't get monotonous for them. Um, but as you're watching these guys, essentially we're, we're rolling through these drills and you see some of them. Um, and so once we get past air starts, then we go to our finish, okay? So the finish drill is essentially everything that you would do in a zone block uh, outside of your, your, your first two steps. So they essentially start fitted up and they start off their aiming point. So our aiming points are going to be eyes to the play side number, backside leg to the crotch um, in terms of what we want, okay? And we wanna to try to have our hands palms up and we would like for them to aim at the bottom of the numbers of that defender. Um, so we want them thinking about all those things uh, and, you know, hands low. That, that's the problem. You don't have, you don't have that much you know, time while you're doing this to think about 17 different things. Um, so we go through these drills and we talk to guys about them. So we also like something I really like to do is these guys are working their aiming points and doing this finish drill that we're, we're using a jerk. Okay. So, this guy's essentially going to simulate a two gap defender and he's going to try to get this guy off his axis. And so it really reinforces all the things we do. I think using this with a jerk where you're telling the defensive lineman, I want you to try to jerk this guy and try to get him on the ground, I think is exponentially better uh, than doing it because it reinforces all these things that this guy we're telling him, we're telling him not to get overextended with your arms in the run game. Now we want to get extended in the pass game, but in the run game, if this guy has space and he's got room to maneuver, he's got room to use his hands uh, and he's got room to press you and get off the block. Whereas if you eliminate that space, it makes it much more difficult for him to do that. Um, we want to make sure. And, and, and so a couple of those things that you really have to reinforce, because if you get overextended with a defensive lineman, he can jerk you a lot of the time. All right. So uh, we want to reinforce all the things we're telling these guys about that. They have to have their feet in the ground as soon as they get up on their toes. They're going to get jerked. They're going to get pulled, and they're going to lose their balance. And if they lose their balance, it's impossible for them to be uh, to be powerful. So uh, we talk about all those things. I didn't love this one, obviously, because we didn't get quite as good a camera angle. This is pre-COVID here, so I always have to explain myself here when I'm like maskless in these videos. But this is before this is before any of that stuff happened here. Um, So this is another, again, so this is like later on. So this is once we get into the fall, better view of a better angle with it. Again, he's going to start, you know, not on his aiming point. We're going to work to our aiming point on that play side number, backside leg through the crotch. Okay. Duke does a really good job here. Um, and so essentially we want to take the play side three quarters of this guy. All right. So what we know about defenders, all right, is typically they're taught to play gaps. Okay. And we know, that this guy's gonna work into his gap, okay? And as soon as he gets his eyes to his play side number, this guy's no longer in his gap, okay? Now he's gotta lift his hips up and he's gotta move his feet in order to get himself back into his gap, okay? And we feel like that point in time, okay, as soon as we've reached him, even if it's ever so slightly, is the best time to be able to move this guy as soon as he's gotta bring his hips up and get back over into his gap, okay? Now we can't be so far into this gap that he can backdoor us and still go get the football because we know we're aiming this thing. This is a vertical downhill play. I think that's one of the biggest things when, when I came in um, that, that we really tried hard to make sure and emphasize is I think you get this kind of general idea about like, oh, they're a zone team. It's kind of like saying they're soft, okay? All right, we're, we're aiming that thing at the play side leg of the center, okay? And we're vertically trying to move you off the football. Um, but we're going to try to do it as intelligently as we can by working these aiming points and try to, to force the things that we know defensive linemen are coached and, and use those things against them. Um, so, again, he's going to take that thing vertically as the backside legs and go vertically at the crotch of the defender. And he's going to take the play side three quarters of them. Okay. And we, you know, typically, typical coaching point is taken thick. All right. We don't want him to be, because again, if he's too far over, he's kind of starting to like 
veer off a little bit to where he's not maybe as tight to the same point as we would like for him to be. So those are the things we coach at that point in time. All right, Sal doing the same drill. All right. Doing a really good job. I think the biggest thing that at first with these guys, so there's sometimes I just don't like how upright they are. So that's one, one thing that we talk about. Like we want your rear end down. We want your knees bent. Okay, but we want your eyes up. So I think you kind of have to almost stand them up before you can then get them back down. Stand them up. Okay, get them, get them going really fast and then gradually get guys to understand, you know, how, how low you have to be ultimately to play the position. So now that being said, it's far more important for me that these guys' feet are in the ground and their hands are properly leveraged than necessarily that they're like in a deep crouch. Okay, the low man wins, but at the same time, if your feet are on the ground and your hands are low, Okay, there's a lot of points of leverage that are going you know, that are that are working in your favor, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit here as we go to um, going to some of the shoulder stuff here. But um, doing a pretty good job just in terms of being on balance and working to his aiming points and working his feet. We want to go as fast as we can, um, but still be on balance if you watch him. So now we go back to the full block. Okay, so essentially this is like the next stage in the progression. So we'll, we'll air start both ways, we'll finish both ways, and then we'll go uh, to the progression of, of you know, the base block. Okay, and again, all these same fundamentals are always the case. So we're probably overkilling it, but we do it a lot, so we need to overkill it some. Uh, and then we're also going to use the jerk. We use the jerk with the finish drill, and we use the jerk also with, uh, with our base drive part of it as well. So, um, and I guess like – we didn't feel like, okay, and I didn't feel like we see these drills so much that that's why we, we spend so much time doing them. Um, and we'll kind of go talk about that more here as we get into some of the game game reps as well. But again, it's it's crucial for these guys that they work the jerks is a really good example. Um, second over from us, not a good camera angle as I would like, but sells, he's a little bit lunged, okay? All right, and he's, he's got his hands in a pretty good spot but he's a little bit leaned. Okay. And he's not, he's not, maybe he's a little bit more on his toes than we would like. All right. But he's doing a really good job with some of the other things he's really tight in terms of where his hands are in relation to this guy. Okay. And his feet are, are, are on the ground pretty good. I just wish he wasn't ducked so much and wish his eyes were up a little bit better, but he's doing a pretty nice job fighting the jerk here pretty well. All right. So now again, this is kind of like the base drive part of it. We can't, you know, you know, use the jerk here when we're, um, Obviously, when we're uh, we got bags and things like that here, but this is kind of what we want that thing to look like. Again, all the same things we talked about before. It's just base drive as one of our tight ends, um, without doing any of these things in terms of the, with the jerk at the end of it. And again, he's doing a pretty good job. His eyes are on his aiming point. We want to be really thick on this thing. And the later you get into the block, the thicker we want those guys to be, because more likely ball is going to go inside and these guys are going to try to try to use their hands and get off and things like that from the side so really good job okay this is an old guy who's been with me here from the from the jump all right that initially the hand is too high love to see him replace that thing and get it down get it where we want to get it really thick through that thing all right so again now we expect that these are these drills that we spend time doing every single day all right, that we've got to be able to see these things and we've got to see them all the time. Otherwise, we need to do different drills. All right, so uh, we don't teach a six inch step, a nine inch step, a 12 inch step, which is what I was taught when I was in, in school. All right, and you know, I would are arguably one of the best offensive line coaches in the world. Um, but you don't know where these guys are being lined up, right? Well, he's a three technique right now. Well, what if he's a what if he's like a true B gap guy? Well, what if he's a four I? Well, then the steps have to change. It's like, well, it's zone. I'm supposed to take a six inch step. What do I do? I can't get there. So um, now we, we, we practice steps. Okay. And we do all those things. All right. Some of that stuff, that drill tape is not, it's not on this, but we're coached. Okay. We coach our guys to get to their aiming points. Okay. And we practice all those different steps, but ultimately there's never a situation where a guy's going to come and say, Hey, listen, I thought I needed to take a shorter step there. And you know, those things, because they know what their aiming points are. We practice all these different things whether this guy's a two eye or he's a two or he's a shaded nose or he's, or he's a head up nose or any of those things. We're going to work on all those steps to make sure that we've repped that the guys get really good at that. But we anticipate that we're going to see all this base drive scenario. I think 
one thing we try really hard to do with these guys is we're always thinking about using our shoulder. We'll talk about the shoulder here in a little bit. Some of that drill tips here is coming up. Um, but they're always thinking that they're going to use their shoulder because if they're thinking they're going to use their shoulder and bring their shoulder through, and then this defender stays in the gap that he's in, um, they can always transition back to using their hands. They can get out of the shoulder and get into their hands, but it's impossible to do it the other way around. So that's something that's pretty important for us. This is us playing Lindenwood. Really, really good team. Really big, you know, athletic fronts. They went, went to the playoffs and won their league and were undefeated in their league. Um, but again, you see kind of what happens with all this wash in terms of what we're talking about. All right. I'm going to get my eyes to the play side number, my backside leg to the crotch. She's not there. Okay. And this guy is going to work over a little bit to get back into his gap. And I'm going to work my eyes to the play side number, my backside leg to the crotch. Okay. We're still thick. We're still vertically trying to move this guy. He's going to work back over to his gap. I'm going to work my aiming points. Okay. He's going to work back in his gap. And eventually you should have all this lateral wash. Okay, so ideally, okay, they play this thing thick and we take really good steps and we get to our aiming points and we work these guys vertically and horizontally. Okay, but if we're continually working really aggressively to our aiming points and we don't ever get there, okay, you should see this where the backside D gap showed up where the ball got snapped. All right, so, and, and we have a really positive play. All right, so you see some of these same things uh, through some of these clips. Um, and if you, as you watch the right guard does a really nice job, backside leg, backside leg, backside leg, backside leg, backside leg, and the guy's off the screen. All right. So, uh, all those same things, this is just base drive. It's all he's doing is base drive. Okay. All right. And all those notes there. As soon as this guy eventually decides, oh crap, I'm out of my gap. I got to go chase after that gap is when you really go from, you know, moving a little bit to move him a lot. Okay, no, we didn't put just put all the good ones on. Okay, all right. Not perfect. So talking again about some of those same things in terms of working guys vertically. Um, as I work to Miami points, he works back to his gap. We use it to create space and things like that. So um, fundamentally, we're not always perfect. Okay, so you can kind of see this thing here. All right, our right guard is a really good player for us. was an all-conference all guy at some point kind of gets stagnant with this block. He's really kind of shuffling his backside leg. He's not taking that thing aggressively uh, to the, to the crotch of the defender. Um, and as soon as you kind of stop, then, then that guy tosses us a little bit here. So again, I think it's really important to take, you know, we want for the, the good reps to reinforce all the things that we're saying. And again, all this is, is just jerk drill, right? So it's like, well, they don't like jer doing jerk drill. Okay. All right. It's hard strenuous. It makes it whatever drill that we're doing a little bit more difficult. Um, but ultimately this is exactly why we have to continue to do it because the D linemen are going to stop jerking just because you don't like it. So um, some more examples here, obviously we use a bunch of Lindenwood tape here, but really nice job here by our right guard. And again, this is again, base drive. So I place that number backside leg through the cross the defender keeps working lateral, keeps working lateral, keeps working laterally. And he's doing a really nice job taking the backside leg through the crotch. All right, a little bit on his toes there. Would love to see him a little bit better in terms of that. But moving and displacing this defender, both vertically and horizontally, um, down and across the football field. So uh, next part of this, and this is something we spend a ton of time on, is our, our shoulder. Okay, and, and using our shoulder and, and shoulder drill is something we do every single day. All right, so essentially with our zone rules, if you have something in your play side gap, you're going to use your hands on that. And if you got something in your backside gap, you're going to use your shoulder on it and be as thick as possible. So he's essentially on his aiming points. There's just not anything in the gap that he's responsible for. They're going to be a backer back there. Somebody's going to be responsible for that gap. Okay, but if there's something to play heavy back onto, uh, then we want them to do it with the shoulder. All right. So this is a really good example of cell. Okay. And this is a player that's been with us here for a couple of years and is right now the left guard, um, but does a really nice. Job. I wish his, wish his uh, shoulder was maybe just a touch lower on this thing, but his foot's in the ground uh, on a second step, which obviously is really good. Um, and he's pretty square. We don't want guys like turning a lot of times when guys work their shoulder a lot. 
they have a tendency to turn away from it. And what I really like about this drill is this is super applicable for everybody. There's times the tackles are going to use this, there's times the centers are going to use this. Obviously, the guards probably use it maybe a little bit more than some others. Um, and then also in all of our gap stuff, we, we use our shoulder on the front side uh, when we're comboing. So all of our, our gap, like three technique combos and front side gap combos, uh, we use the same stuff. So this is really applicable for a lot of different parts of our offense. And we're going to get a lot of utility out of doing this drill. So, but he does a nice job. He's on balance. The biggest thing is we're doing this drill, but we want to make sure that we do this drill in a way that it allows this guy uh, answers for anything that he can conceivably see, okay, from whoever we're playing. So he's got to go. He, he's a left guard. He's got a three technique. Okay, all right, he's going to use his shoulder on this thing. All right, well, if this guy moves, okay, inside, is he going to be able to adjust? Well, if he's on his, if he's on his toes, he probably will fall and not be able to adjust. We want to make sure that he's on balance. So as he's doing this drill, do we know the things in the way and the manner in which we're doing this drill is going to be applicable to essentially every circ circumstance he would, he would have. We could get off balance and we could like dive our torso at this thing uh, if we really wanted to, but ultimately if those guys moved at all, which inevitably they're going to, um, then you're, you're out of luck. Um, so I think the other things we try to tell our guys is why this is so important. I think we probably got more variables last year. You know, we play in one of the most competitive division two conferences in the country, we play against really, really good teams. And we were having some pretty decent success at times, but I think probably in five or six of our 11 games, uh, we saw things, consistently and as a plan from teams that maybe we hadn't seen on film, which is that I always tell the guys that's a tremendous compliment to them when teams are pulling things out, you know, their hat that they didn't maybe necessarily show before because they think they need those things in order to stop you. But at the same time, all the things that we do uh, as coaches and, and, you know, preparing and game plan and all those things, it really tests all those things because you have to make sure that your guys, you and your, your, your staff and your players and all those guys, can adjust on the fly and whatever plan we give them is going to be applicable at any point in time. And I think most D coordinators, their, their default response is to move all over the place. All right. So it's really critical. We talk to these guys about this all the time about being on balance, because if this guy moves, are you still going to be okay? That's the thing we ask those guys all the time. Um, and, and we want to make sure that we do the drills in a way that's conducive to being successful in those situations as well. So. All right, so it's very, very good at this drill. Kev's very good at this drill as well. Only thing I would say to him is he's kind of turned a little bit. So we're going to use our shoulder on this thing. So obviously if we had, you know, we had like a, a B-gap defender. This is our, our, our left tackle here. And, and uh, you know, if there's instances in which we're running like inside zone against the bear or something like that, just different things where the, the, the tackle is going to use this as well. He's a left tackle. Okay, I think he thinks he's playing right tackle at this point in time, but ultimately – we're running inside zone and the backer gets a little bit wider. And now you need to go in there thinking I'm going to use my shoulder and then just, if that's not what happens, you get a free release, all those different types of things. So, we, but all the same things apply. The, the, the fundamentals and principles of the drill don't change, but I always try to remind these guys, Hey, this is where you would use this. Okay. And if you got a guy doing a drill, you're like, Oh man, I can't think of a single instance in which you would use this. Um, you know, you have to do different drills. That's what I've always Really believe more now than ever. So, um, so again, a little bit more with the shoulder drill. So this is like older clips um, from the fall of nineteen. Same things here, different players. Sells a little different human here at this point. A little bit younger in his progression here. Was playing as a retro freshman for us some. All right, but a lot of the same things. This is kind of an earlier clip of the same drill. All right. As an older player, it's been with me just a little bit longer at this point in time. It was a senior in 19, um, doing the shoulder drill, on balance, using his shoulder, he's square, all those things we really like. Okay, and again, he's still on his own aiming point. I mean, he's like maybe slightly further past it. But again, it's because there's nothing in his gap. And so we want to do and be really thick on these things. We always do these things, this particular drill on a line, just so they can see if they take too lateral a step and they start drifting over into the space, we want them to be able to see that um, so that you know, we can even correct it. Recognize it's much easier to do when we do this on a, on a yard line. So that's another thing we like to do when, our shoulder, when we do our shoulder drill. 
Okay. So this is this is this fall, or excuse me, this spring. All right. And just other things we like to use in terms of drill. So I always talk to guys about this, and there's more stuff I should probably talk about just in terms of, you know, I always like to, um, I've had a bunch of high school coaches approach me about drilling this, um, you know, repping it and, and just inside zone in general. And I think what I've always found is inside zone is a little bit more complicated for kids to understand because you're blocking an area, you're not necessarily blocking a person. So what I've always told guys is if you're going to do this stuff, you need to have your drills ready. You need to have your plan ready. And then you need to be really patient because it's tougher to recognize that I essentially have whatever comes in this gap. And now I have to teach him how to work this path and what's on this path and exactly how we want that to look versus you got that guy, go block that guy. That's much easier for kids to understand. But I think what I would say um, to all the high school guys that I've talked to about this, and again, I started as a high school guy. So that's obviously where I, where I began in the profession is it's more complicated to do, but at the same time, you have more answers to some of the things that the teams are going to throw at you when things get crazy and you get into, you know, really well-coached teams. They basically say, okay, we're just going to move all over the place and create havoc, and, and that's, that's going to be our answer to whatever it is you're doing. If you get that, if somebody decides they're going to do that, you're running a bunch of man schemes, it, it's going to be tough for you. All right. Um, and we have man schemes. We've run man schemes, coach man schemes. But at the end of the day, uh, this is going to be probably, you know, it's, it, there's more investment there. But when you get in those situations, you might have a little bit better answers. But it's a lot of guys have came and talked to me and said, like, listen, we did this for like, you know, we did a, a, a good amount for like three, four days and the kids weren't getting them stopped. And so um, but then at the same time, they had guys kind of do the opposite as well. It just depends. And I think if you've got a guy that you have a tough time blocking or your guys maybe aren't as big or things like that, to me, this is like the most effective way to move guys, especially if they're bigger, faster, stronger than you are. Um, Cause I've had a bunch of you know, different guys came up to me and just say, man, coach, we, we can't run zone. We don't have all these big guys. I'm like, man, I would, I would like exclusively, you know, run zone then. So, and we believe in it. And obviously we've done it for a long time. So a lot of these answers we have, and it took a long time to, to get those answers. So we certainly don't have them all, but um, so in terms of just the things that we would usually talk about, we talk about inside zone. Those are, those are some of them. So we're, we're going to label this. We're going to idea. We essentially have a shoulder combo going on here and shoulder combo going on here. Big thing is because I don't necessarily love like he's leaning back off of this course in order to get this shoulder in on this deal. But what I do like is when guys are trying to be thick and guys are trying to um, be as physical as they can on those defenders. And I think it's really important to hammer those guys about teeing off on the defensive lineman because I think a lot of times, and this happened to me when I was a young player, is this guy runs through and everybody freaks out, okay? All right, which, you know, that's, that happens in a lot of different areas. And it's college football, so we knew eventually somebody was going to freak out. But I think what's really important is that you support this kid and that you tell him, like, listen, I want you to kill the three technique, okay? All right, and if we get a little bit overzealous in terms of doing that, and this guy runs through, we're not going to freak out at this guy. We're going to say, hey, listen, we got to come off a little bit faster. But I love what you did with that three technique. So we always want to err on the side of being thick and being vertical and being physical on defensive linemen, whether it be power, whether it be, you know, whatever those things are. So uh, because we don't want him to get off balance and start, again, as soon as he starts, like, not really totally focusing himself on getting after this three technique and he's peeking the back or peeking the back or peeking the back or peeking the back or uh, is when the, the double team doesn't end up being as good. All right. So we, we really want to hammer this in the way that we coach it by, you know, not by kind of giving those guys some leeway if they stay on that thing a little bit too long, obviously we got to get them off. we got to get them onto the backer, but he's been, he's been coached that way for you know the whole time he's been there. He's at the end of his third year with us, the sixth semester with us right now. Uh, and so, I, again, I don't necessarily like that he's, he's kind of coming off his course in order to get on this thing. But at the same time, that is indicative because I, I, I tell you what, I'd rather like, you know, have something bad happen 
because this guy runs through in a big game that never, ever do anything on the three technique to the point that the guy didn't have to have, have to run downhill in the first place. So uh, we want to err on the side of being too thick on those guys. Um, but he's doing a good job. He's on balance. He can come off to the backer and, and does a really nice job here. As uh, I wish his hands were a little bit tighter and you're kind of seeing some of those things. Uh, and then as you go over and watch the, the right guard, um, you're seeing a shoulder transition to hands. He's using his shoulder. The center bangs it over to him. He transitions and uses his hands. He's doing a really good job with all these things that we're asking him to do in terms of getting his feet in the ground. But he's still a young pup, so not quite there yet. But really good fundamentally in terms of doing exactly what we're asking him to do, playing against a really good player. We do some couple periods where we we scout up with our good players for our, our defense, and they do the same thing for us. we got good players out here that we're playing against. So back to some more game reps. Um, and, and, you know, another instance of the shoulder drill, all right? And when you watch Max here, he's thick, he's thick, he's thick, he's thick, he's thick. It's time to come off, he comes off. Now, was he a little bit late? Yeah, probably. Maybe we would have come off a little bit sooner. We're not, like, murdering this, this, this defensive lineman now by any stretch. Um, but I love how patient he is. I love that his feet are in the ground, all right? sees it comes off rip so um i think you kind of got it you can't have it both ways so it's like we we want to come off to the backers but we're really going to emphasize getting off on this three technique and doing everything in the right way there uh, and then making sure that we we if they're on balance and that they can see what they're doing and and all those things are right. We haven't had a huge problem with guys being on balance and coming off the backers. I don't like the way that we kind of got there and stopped a little bit. All right, but at the same time, kind of same drill. So other thing, and I, I got off on a tangent, I apologize, but this is like, if you're at a smaller school and you don't have a lot of guys, we do a lot of this four fifths line stuff and it's been really good for us. Obviously we're in a different situation um, because we're at a college and we have a few more guys and things like that, but this is really, Everybody gets to that point in the season where you're kind of banged up and it's really hard to do any drills. To me, this has been a really good deal for us because when we talk to our back, the ball is hitting here and the other guy really has no consequence. We could put a tight end on the front side. That really wouldn't have that much consequence, 90, you know, whatever percent of the time. The ball is hitting somewhere front side A gap to back. Okay. Um, and so as we as we were able to do this, this has allowed us to get more reps with our guys. So um, obviously, the tackles aren't taking as many reps into this four-fifths line stuff, but it allows us to do our gap stuff back into the boundary. It allows us to do inside zone stuff back to the field. It allows us to do wide zone stuff back into the boundary, and it's really allowed us <clears> – because <throat> like everybody else, we, we, we did a lot of half-line stuff for a long time, and it just wasn't – I mean, it wasn't given – it's like it just wasn't quite as good a look because, again, when you, you run a lot of wides, and a lot of the times that thing's got to bend back, and it's like – and you really can't do this unless you have everybody uh, or unless you put that backside guard in there. Because, again, that eliminates you from doing any of your pull stuff. Or you're you're going to run power or, or counter or whatever those things are. Uh, this allows you to, to, to do that stuff. So um, with the four-fifths line stuff. Now, we obviously we throw our tight ends in here to work, you know, just different cutoff things and, you know, and some of that stuff. So these guys are not – doing a great job here in this particular instance. So, and again, you're going to see us in all different types of form. We, we like to use tight ends and we like to, you know, we like to use not tight ends, depending on what, what the look is and what the team is and what they're going to do to us and how they're going to play those things and things like that. But I don't think there's a better illustration of when the defensive lineman gets out of his gap and gets in a hurry to get back to his gap uh, than, than some of this stuff. And so we're, we're, we're working on it too. So again, the, the right guard's going to use his rules. He's going to say, listen, I know this is a B, you know, it's an A gap player and he's in my gap, but I'm going to come through this thing with my shoulder thinking that, you know, if he's slow off the ball or if he just, you know, is changing gaps or a variety of things that can happen um, that, you know, if he ends up in this backside gap, I'm going to use my shoulder in case he ends up there. So he does a really nice job on this. And he can kind of feel himself like, oh, no, I'm supposed to be in the A gap. I can get back into the A gap, raises his hips up, and the, and the tackle does a really nice job uh, burying him and, and, and getting to the, to the linebacker as well. So 
ends up being a big play. Similar deal, same opponent. All right, we kind of did these things in groupings, I guess. Uh, but we're we're going to work this shoulder here. We're going to try to work this shoulder. It needed to be a little bit more thick on this right shoulder here from Max. All right, because we would love to like rip this thing right here, and we just kind of allowed ourselves to get condensed into that space a little bit. Uh, but the left guard does a really good job getting his right shoulder in there, working to that back or finishing on the back or you see the shoulder drill here work on, on both avenues. All right. Now he's doing the base drive drill. He's doing the base drive drill. So we kind of see all of our drills going on at the field at one time, all right, which we always like that. And, and again, good or bad, it lets us know that um, we're doing the right stuff. So, all right, so Aslan, really good opponent, okay? It was in the GLIAC, no, no longer in the GLIAC, um, but extremely well coached, physical. So uh, opponents like this are a tremendous test of like, okay, well, I believe this. I believe doing a lot of shoulder drills is the right way to go. I believe you know doing drills the way that we do them and, and some of these things are the right way to go and the right things to do. And then we pull, go play against these elite opponents and obviously those, those are really the ultimate test. If we feel like these things are really good and they better be effective against these guys or we're doing the wrong stuff. So, um, but you see some, some pretty good zone shoulder going on here. Again, guys working at aiming points, being thick in relation to where their linebackers are and that type of thing. Obviously he's got a stacked back over top of this three technique and a 30. And so he knows he's got a little bit more room uh, and a little bit more area to be thick on this. We've got a really wide five on the other side and a 30 back on the other side. So he knows there's not like a super threatening B gap situation here. And he could be really thick on the shoulder uh, as he works back to that mic, uh, who would probably point the mic in this situation. Um, the guys are doing a really nice job working aiming points and finishing. We kind of see some jerk drills and all those things that, that we really like to see uh, based on drill tape and, and some of that, that, that stuff. So, all right, Ashland again here. All right, this is not our favorite thing to have happen as offensive line coaches when we got a giant rip shot seam and we're throwing the ball, but we, that's the price of doing business and RPO. And we knew it, we, we signed up for it. So, uh, but again, you see some really nice combinations on the two eye on the front side and the three on the back side. And guys are doing some good work in terms of working with those backers against a really, really good opponent. So, all right. 